this was going to be a conversation until we were going to sit down, but I realise that there are people at the back who um, would just feel, feel out of that conversation. So we're going to stand up. So it seems a little bit artificial as a conversation. At least to be in the field of vision of the camera. That doesn't matter. It's more important. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I've got to kick off and I've got about 10 minutes to make my case. I think I'll begin by saying that, in my view, there are um, three ways of acquiring knowledge. One is by um, referring to ancient texts and hoping that they've got it right. The other is sitting around and thinking about what the world is like and hoping that you've got it right. And the third is going out and actually <coughs> inspecting the world and hoping that you get it right. Now the first, of course, is religion. And we know where that leads in terms of understanding. The second is, in, is philosophy. And we know where that leads to um, in, in understanding. My argument is nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and the third way is science. <coughs> and you can either do what the Greeks did, sit around in your marble arm chairs and reflect upon what the world should be like and hope that you're getting it right that way. Or you do what people like Galileo and his successors did, which is to go out and apply what we can call the scientific method. And the scientific method has, of course, been extraordinarily powerful. Um, I suppose the, of those three categories, those um, religious philosophers and scientists, I think it's fair to say that um, theologians, those who deal with the first way of understanding, um, uh, obfuscate the world. The um, philosophers, I'm not quite sure what they do, but they certainly <laughs> do. Um, um, and the, the scientists illuminate the world. And I think that's an extraordinary powerful argument in favour of science. By the scientific method, and I'm sure this will uh, come into play shortly, although in the supper before this we discovered that we actually agreed entirely with what each of us was saying, so we're actually inventing uh, uh, <laughs> um, hatred. <laughs> um, um, by the scientific method, I mean um, going out and looking at things, and then talking about it. And I don't mean just amiably wandering through the universe and um, making notes and then chattering to whoever passes you by, but doing controlled experiments on what there is there, isolating parts of the world um, <coughs> so that you can identify really their deep nature and the way that they operate. And then the Talking about it is, of course, the process of peer review allied with setting your discovery in a network of, the, of what is already known. So science is a reticulation of knowledge. Science is a network of ideas, and you can't have an idea in one part of science that clashes elsewhere with um, an idea arising from other, another kind of study. And indeed, the reason for confidence in the nature of the scientific endeavour is that um, concepts and understanding arises in, if you like, many springs and forms many rivers. And where the rivers mingle, they support each other. They don't conflict. And I suppose nowhere is this more... Um, obvious than the way that in order to understand the large-scale working of the universe, the, to do cosmology, you actually have to draw on knowledge of elementary particles. Um, of course, science is not complete, and so, um, of, uh, but it is a developing subject. Um, religion, of course, doesn't develop. Philosophy 
develops in a kind of circular way. But um, <laughs> science progresses, and you, there's a natural sense of science progressing with understanding deepening. But the question um, in front of us today is really whether science can tackle all the great questions of existence, really. Is there, of course it can deal with the titration of an acid. Of course it can deal with measuring the mass of an electron. But can it deal with the serious questions that have troubled mankind for, for, for millennia? And my view is that science is without bound. Of course, to argue that particular case, you have to distinguish um, real questions from false questions, empty questions, if you like. Um, empty questions, which are mostly the stuff of religion, of course, but um, empty questions include um, inventions by theologians and philosophers, um, which they then seek to explain. Examples of empty questions would be, say, the purpose of the universe. And there is no evidence that the universe has any purpose, so why waste time trying to disentangle and identify that, that purpose? Um, there are real questions. Um, and the real questions include in the origin of the universe, the long-term future of the universe, and what goes on in between. So I think that science is capable of answering or illuminating every one of those real questions. And the real questions, in my view, are how the universe came into being without intervention. Hugely difficult question, and one which the scientists certainly have not cracked yet. <coughs> but think of the progress that they have made over the past 100 years compared with philosophical and religious um, speculations over the past 10,000 years. And you'll see really the power <coughs> of science. Of course, in due course, we will have to start imagining how absolutely nothing can come into, can, can turn itself into apparently something without intervention. And that's a serious difficulty for science, but it's only a pessimist who thinks that science will forever be silent on such a question. Uh, we understand the origin of the biosphere. Um, 300 years ago, 200 years ago, people simply had to resort to myth. Now, of course, through, um, through evolution, um, a theory of natural selection, we understand the processes that have developed the biosphere. There remains a problem about the actual inception of life, the way that the inorganic became the organic, but the fact that we don't know the true answer to that is not a sign that science has failed, because scientists have many ideas about what might have happened, and it's a matter not of rushing in and saying and asserting what happened, but of cautiously identifying what happened through the scientific method that I discussed before. Um, the nature of consciousness is another real big question that um, science is currently grappling with and has not solved. And I think um, it's together with the origin of the universe, the origin in that universe of our ability to reflect upon the origin is an extraordinarily important and um, pressing problem. A philosopher might say that science cannot illuminate the subjective. I think that is nonsense. I think um, the theories of the origin of the universe will be quite different from theories of consciousness, whereas the theory of the origin of um, 
the universe will be a mathematical theory um, with some sort of formula. The theories of consciousness will not be of that kind. They will be almost certainly simulations using some kind of computer, not necessarily a digital computer. But certainly um, neuroscientists are developing their understanding of the systems that <coughs> jointly contribute to the brain. We can watch conscious events in progress through functional MRI and such like, and we're starting to build computers that certainly emulate aspects of consciousness. And once you've emulated consciousness, you can start to do experiments on it, and you can understand why people hallucinate and perhaps resort to religious belief. But um, I must sit down now because I think my ten minutes is up. I think I would say, and it really depends what Stephen's going to say, that the distinction between a scientist and a philosopher uh, can be expressed very succinctly. Um, that scientists are optimists and philosophers are pessimists. <laughs> that philosophers will aver that we cannot, we scientists, go there until we have, whereupon they have to change their minds. So, um, whereas scientists ta tackle, tackle problems, attack problems from the point of view that they expect to solve them, and they are intrinsically optimistic, they have to be optimistic, and the driving force of science is optimism. I'll sit down on that. <laughs>